Let me announce our lovely guests. Let's get them up here and then let's talk to them and maybe annoy them. First and foremost, Justin Briner. Lucy Christian. Jay Michael Tatum. Rico Fajardo. Felicia Angele. Angele. I can't say anything right, but she has a lovely name and I'm a moron. Welcome her because she's beautiful and talented and better than me. All right, guys. I figured we, uh, we'll get you warmed up. We'll, we'll get in the jacuzzi and just uh, simmer, you know, simmer, chill. Everybody has their mics on. You just gotta check, flip them. Check. 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 Oh, Everybody's oh, checked oh, and ready yeah. to go. Okay, yeah, let's hear it. I, I, have a, I have a question that I like to ask, well, relatively everybody, but feel free not to answer if you think it's too silly. Uh, to you, with your own perspective and, and, uh, and uh, observations in life, what does anime smell like to you? If anime had a scent, what does it smell like to you? It can be a very brief description, it can be a very vivid description. Whatever you want to give me, I just want to hear you. Whoever wants to go first, you know, this just is going to be 2020. That's the actual question? Yeah, yeah, believe it or not. Is this on? I believe it is. I believe it is. Hello? It hates me. Can you hear me? Hello? Can I? Hi? Yeah, yeah. Hello? Hello. Hello. That's what anime smells like to me. Anime smells like a carpeted sound booth and a microphone. <laughs> it's, very, it's a very particular smell. And you get very used to it. You're like, what's up? That smells like a pop screen. That's what that is. <laughs> see, I see it from like the point of view of like a, a, a viewer. So like a, when you open up a, a, a crisp Blu-ray and then that, that, ink, that inky, smelly, whatever you make Blu-ray discs out of smell. Probably is effing with my brain. I don't know what that is, but like, that's anime. My eyes are all dilated. <laughs> well, that's anime. <laughs> all right, let me hear. Can I get some of that. <laughs> you guys got any of that blue? <laughs> Did anybody else want to answer that? You don't have to. Only well, if you want. For me, it's a it's a summer morning in 2002. Ooh. And an original Pizza Hut stuffed crust pizza. Oh, oh my god! So my stars. Crust. I am so oh. hungry right now. <laughs> I think everybody really felt hungry. that spiritually. That's nice. That's great. That's that wins. That's really good. Okay. All right. That wins. Let me let me let me get a little bit more serious here. Yeah. All right. We'll just jump right on into it. Describe to me the most challenging aspect of your career at the very beginning of your career, the very fruition of your career, compared to what is most challenging in your life today with your career now. Presently. Wow. He said life, and I was like, oh, that's a whole. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, career. Oh, okay, okay, career. Okay. 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 God, that's a great question. Well, I, I, well, I, I didn't know I'd have to that. study for this panel. Yeah. <laughs> and and who's ever most confident or knows more about themselves? Go for it. I will say that challenging in the beginning was I, I did not know how to dub. <laughs> Like, you don't know how. And I, I very fortunately fell into uh, a lead very, very quickly and was like, I mean, and, and I just had to figure it out. But there was time, I felt like, on the job to figure it out. Things were a lot slower then than they are now. Um, but I very much remember like going to, I think I had dial-up internet. I went to Anime News Network. And I realized that people were going to be reviewing the work, and I was like, oh no, I don't know what I'm doing. They're going to hate it. Um, oh no. Narrator, it has worked out. Um, but today, the challenges today, I feel like there's so much anime. There are so many different stories. I've gotten to do this for a really long time. And um, so the challenge is to approach it. <laughs> <laughs> To approach it fresh in a fresh way and try to still, you know, do a good job. Like, still, that's the thing, I think. What about you guys? I, you know, yeah, because I mean, I've done it for a while. It's a while. <laughs> Shut up, you oh, have to laugh. Oh, it's easy. Back when we used to watch our anime on so cave walls by like torchlight. <laughs> Remember when there were four episodes to oh, a disc? Remember when they'd come out these huge box sets with all the room in them and it just pissed you off? 
Um, remember clamshell cases? Boys up here, they're like, Crickets, crickets. They're like, what's a I boomer? signed some today. Um, I signed some today. Good job, everybody. I think, but yeah, I agree with Lucy. The, in the beginning, you know, because we're all trained actors, but like, you don't really, no one really teaches you how to dub. They certainly didn't then. It was like, you just do it. You do the words and they have to fit and still be persuasive emotionally. And then here's what a dub script looks like. It looks like no other kind of script you'd ever encountered. It looks like a, an itemized hotel receipt. <laughs> and with all sorts of anagrams that make no sense, and someone has to explain what does CT react? That means, oh, that means you're going, you're doing clenched this, teeth. clenched teeth. Oh, well, thanks for telling me. Um, but so it was the, the, at the beginning, it was real, because I, I was just kind of thrown into it too. Like, I was a stage actor, and my friend Chris Bevins was like, hey, do you want to be an anime? And I was like, well, what do I do? And then I was like, this is hard. <laughs> I want to take longer with this line because I'm feeling it. He's like, nope, you can't. You got to make it shorter. It's got to fit the flaps, the mouth. Because that's the technical term for mouth movements in anime. And so in the early days, it was just doing it and, and like figuring out, oh, this is how, OK, I've got to make this line shorter, or I've got to stretch this line out, or I've got to, oh, god. Nothing screws your read up like a Japanese word you have to say in the middle of it that you're like, oh wait, how do I say that? Um, there's just a lot of learning curves, and but you know once you get it down, you, you kind of run into a rhythm. But I think now, 20 years later, uh, the challenge is uh, doing things that are unexpected because like now when people approach you know you for for work or they're like, hey, we'd like you to we'd like you to read for this. I'm kind of at a dilemma, you know, do I give them the obvious read, do they give them the Tatum read, uh, or do I try to, do I take a risk and, and kind of go against maybe what they expect, because I don't know, now there's more of a, I feel like I have less freedom when I audition because I'm kind of competing with my own resume, if that oh, makes sense. Yeah. That's, That's a well great on the wow. yeah. And, and so, you know, so, so it's, you have to strike this careful balance between giving them, oh, you know, give them, satisfy why they came to you in the first place, but also, you know, make their, make their choice to cast you if they're going to do that a little less easy. Like, I don't want anyone to cast me because I'm the obvious choice. You know, does that make sense? Absolutely, Absolutely man. It's funny when you, have, has anyone here gotten the audition where, like, one of the specs is like, we want this kind of sound, and it's your sound. <laughs> yeah. Like, You're looking for a J. Michael Tatum. I'm like, well, you came to the right You literally, it's me. <laughs> just cast me. <laughs> And then I don't win the audition. I know, so that's it. You're like, who took my work? <laughs> that has happened. That's happened. I've, I've crossed that, that threshold. That Rubicon. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I guess I, uh, that just gave me, you just sparked so many thoughts in my mind, man, about like starting off. I uh, also went to school for, for theater and things. And so, uh, but I also grew up watching anime. And so, oh, man, you guys, so many of these shows meant so much to me. All those little boxed VHS. Do you know what a video cassette is? Yes. Uh, yeah, let's hear it for VHS. Back in my day, you couldn't you couldn't get your anime all at once. You had to go to the library, and there was like you know two VHS for Ronda one half, but some son of a gun wouldn't return part three. So you had to you had to imagine in your brain what part three was like. You talk to your friends at school, and you're like, I bet he did this, and I bet she did that. Oh, cool. And then watch part four. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like, gr growing up, uh, I, I, well, when I finally got to, to work on some stuff, and it was uh, Zach Bolton was directing me, and uh, Chris George was engineering, and they were like, all right, you know, let's, let's do this thing. Uh, I was working, uh, and I thought, man, I want to be precious with every single line. Like, when I first started, I shouldn't say precious, because that's what I call it now, but back in the day, because we work at really quick speeds, you guys, like, in theater, we'll rehearse the play a bunch till you know all of Hamlet's lines. This one, you don't know the lines. You see the line, you're like, cool, let's go. I sure hope this makes sense, given the context of the whole body of the world. So it's that's, like an acting mandala. Like, you set it up, yeah. and then it's gone. Yeah, and then it's yeah. gone. You literally, yeah. that's exact. And that was a very strange thing for me starting out because I, I wanted to be in the story. I want to absorb it. I want to know what's going on, even though I am kid number three. You know what I mean? I still, it's true, you guys. I mean, like, I, I'm like in it. That's the theater acting in me. Like, I'm like, there's no small, there's no small roles. Or, you know, wait, oh, only small people? I don't, wait, I don't know. That's what I'm saying, go. There's no small roles. There's no, right. small, there's no small parts, only small actors. Small actors, that's right. Correct. Yes. Anyway, I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to give every role like it's due. And so, but that like, man, slowed it down and like me asking all these questions, these actor questions, like there weren't, I, I learned uh, to be more deliberate and specific uh, with my questions as I, as I grew, grew up and, you know, with anime, working on it. And then now I guess, you know, it is, man, you said it, 
you really said it right on the, you hit the nail on the head, dude. Like, there's that sense where people go, oh yeah, uh, Rico, this high energetic character, we can do that. Rico knocked that out of the park. Uh, but any of these like more dramatic reads, like I, I have been told by directors, like, oh no, I didn't like, you know, you're, you're like in this, this wheelhouse. I'm like, dude, like I'm not even like tooting my own horn. I don't want to tooting my own horn, but I'm pretty good at like a few other things you've probably never heard. But because, because you keep getting cast as these things, you're never gonna hear, you know, that from you. Yeah. So yeah, competing with sort of like your 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 shadow on a you know Mario Kart, it's like so fast. Your ghost is so fast. Get back here, get back here, Yoshi. I just love your thought process. I want you to write just a stream of consciousness book, like on the road for anime dub voice. So is, literally, you guys are living in my brain the whole time. That's five minutes I've been talking. Anyway. No, I love it. I love it. I love it. Alicia, um, for me, I. It's really weird. I think it might mean that I'm in a good place now. I'm having a hard time thinking of what's the most difficult right now. But in the beginning, uh, it definitely was learning not to cut away the things that make me me to try to fit some idea of perfection. And uh, we're just going to real talk real quick. Uh, perfection is a lie. It does not exist. If it did, it would be boring because no one could relate to it because no one is perfect because it doesn't exist. <laughs> and, you and, and real well said. Well it's said. And it's brilliant. Well said. And, like, and this, go, this, is, this is true of any creative endeavor, right? It, perfectionism is just your own BS way of buying yourself time. It's, it's, okay. it's procrastination. That's it. It's like, no, I can't do this until it's perfect. Rebranded procrastination. Right. That's you clever, <laughs> clever girl. <laughs> You aren't working on it, are you? <laughs> Where I really started to see, because I was very lucky very early on that I had uh, some people, uh, Colleen Blinkenbeard was a huge champion for me, and I still don't know what I ever did to deserve her, but I'm thankful constantly. Um, but the more people got to see me be myself and not be like the perfect, polite, robot version of me that I thought was universally likable, the more I got really interesting stuff to dig into because they could see the human under what I had. And now I am just messy all the time. I'm a goblin, oh, yeah. and I'm a gremlin, and I'm happy about it. Um, if I did have to pick something for now, I think it might be uh, making sure that I'm filling the well that I create from, that I'm not just asking myself to produce that I'm also uh, taking care of myself emotionally, in my relationships, um, and creatively, that I'm consuming things that excite me and fuel me and drive me forward. Heck yeah. That was well said. God, that's such a beautiful that's beautiful. Yeah. How about you, Captain? Oh, I can't follow all that. <laughs> Just infinite profundity. Um, no, it's, it's a lot of similar sentiments. Um, I think, you know, as a creative in any field, you tend to get in your own way a lot more than you'd like. Uh, so there is something to be learned, and it's not an easy lesson. Is a, you know, get out of my way. I'm doing me. Um, I don't know. It maybe a, a particular difficulty I've had. I don't know. If y'all have noticed, the past couple years have been a little weird. <laughs> There's something in the water. Um, <laughs> I, I, full disclosure, full, F disclosure, y'all, um, I, I really struggled um, getting my own recording space and, and getting that acoustically sound, and it, it wasn't easy. I still don't really have it right. So I, uh, I really appreciate a lot of the magic that <laughs> the experts lend to it, my directors and my, and my engineers who, who really pull it the, all the weight. Uh, so <laughs> when it was just little old me in my closet, in my bathroom, uh, I was like, this doesn't feel the same. This is hard. Uh, you yeah. should appreciate things. Oh my god, well big time. And I always appreciated it, but uh, now I, it's just changed my whole perspective. So I'm still learning, y'all. Aren't we all? I can't tell you how, like home recording, because I am not technically technologically inclined at all, but my husband, Brandon, is, and I can't tell you how many times directors on the other end of that Zoom call have heard me go, hang on just a minute, Brandon! <laughs> <laughs> I can't find the knob! <laughs> Did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, well, the, beautiful, all of you, all right.
let me throw something else at you. Let me know if you think this is interesting. Which character, if any, changed you as a person through the process? Oh. Hmm? Huh? Yeah, your name. Anybody want to do that one? Uh, I'll, I'll say one that's kind of, uh, and someone, a few people came up in line and asked the question, like, what's your favorite role? Uh, I usually say Kotaro Tatsumi from Zombieland Saga but, because he's just full of energy, but there's a role that I played, uh, Haruhiro of Grimgar of, of Ashes and Illusions, which is actually Felicia directing me on it. My good friend Justin over there is in that show. Uh, many colleagues are, and, and, uh, and it meant so much to me because I'm a big old gamer. It was perfect for Level Up because I play a lot of games, and it also involved a, a party of people that just met for the first time, and I felt like that was one of my first, I had, I had like maybe one or two leads before that, but like that, that one was really special to me because it was the first time I got to work, I felt intimately with a lot of people who became my friends later. Uh, because I didn't really know much about Justin, honestly. I mean, and that's the voice world, of, this is pre-pandemic, by the way, you guys. Like, if you can imagine. Many, <laughs> many, many years ago. Uh, four times. Before four times, correct. Uh, uh, Justin, Justin uh, uh, Jeannie Toronto, uh, Sarah Wiedenheft, Jared Green, uh, a, lot of, a lot of friendos who just, uh, it, like, now I feel like I know so well, and that story specifically uh, was about, like, learning people and going on this journey with them. And also, that was, uh, I mean, you're on the director's chair, but, like, you know, it was a, a wonderful journey. I feel a lot of my, my heart in that in that show. So, yeah, that one changed me. Uh, I'm not sure how, as I'm talking to you now, but I guess in a what way that it made me more con like considerate of my fellow performers. If for voice, if that makes sense. Again, you guys like theater, yeah. right? Like I'm looking at you. We're doing a show. Like, we're a show together. When a yeah. cast is that intimate, too, like it's a very small cast. Most of the scenes are relationship building. It frames it differently than a show, uh, like a, a one piece situation where you might end up uh, with a list of pirates A through triple Z yeah. in a single yeah. episode. Yeah. Fishnet. Uh, <laughs> Fishnet, like <laughs> Navy, Marine. Oh but uh, like, had a, a beautiful scene, it was uh, with Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie's character, Yume, uh, we, uh, one of our, our party members is lost. And it's just this sweet slice of life kind of scene outside of like the hot, the, the, not the hot spring. It's the 13th episode. <laughs> it's not the hot spring episode. Uh, it's a, like, a, like they're, they're taking turns, but they're very poor. They can't afford to do very much because they're not a very good party. Uh, but they've just lost one of their integral teammates. And uh, she's dealing with it in a different way than he is. And they're learning each other, but they're weeping. And they don't know how to explain how they feel. And I felt like I learned so much about each of my colleagues in this show where we're like lost children trying to cling to each other for some sense of family. And I was like, it meant so much. And that's, that's what I think it is. It's that sense of fam uh, familial bonding with, with a cast through voice. Yeah. Which is, I mean, obviously we're here for my hero. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, still, they, you know, yeah. I think simultaneously, I think not only you guys did that as a cast, but I think the characters did that in the show. Yes, correct. Thank right? you. Thank you for clarifying. I was like trying to arrive at it. <laughs> no, it, it's beautiful. Well said. Anybody else? Yeah, Any I, I think my go-to when that question gets asked is, is always Okabe from Steins Gate. Um, which is a show that some people, there's always a few that are like, oh my god, I love that show. And I had, it was the first time I'd ever worked on the show as the lead and as the lead adaptive writer, which was really weird. I don't like being in stuff. I don't like being the lead in something that I've written because then I have no one to blame if it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it's my words. Oh. Um, but it was a really, and I got to write it along with uh, Patrick Seitz, who was just a phenomenal human being and writer, and, and it was, we were huge fans of the show, so we, would just, we, we were such fanboys for it. And it was a real gift to get to write it, and then months later, it's back in the old days when we had a lot of time to kind of suss out the entire adaptation process before we started recording, or at least have a good six or seven episodes adapted before we got to the recording booth. So when we were writing it, I had no intention of playing the main character, but I, you know, because I write, but like I act, I put a lot of myself into what I'm doing. And Kali, the director, was like, well, this is gonna be you. And I'm like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and she auditioned a lot of people, but I, I, she made me audition in the end. She was like, it's gonna be you, it's gonna be you. And I had never had that level of stress. Now, I've been acting in one form or another since I was about nine years old. And 
you know, when you're on stage and you have the chance to rehearse stuff, and to a lesser extent if you're on camera and you've got, you know, the luxury of time to work out the blocking and everything, it can be very intense. You know, there's a lot there present to help you kind of get swept up in the moment, and so sometimes very real things can happen. But it doesn't happen that often in the recording booth, if I'm 100% honest, because it's such an artificial environment. So we have to bring a lot of our acting chops to bear on that process, because it's not just right there in front of us the way it can be in other more traditional forms of the craft. You know, we don't have costumes to work with. We don't record with each other. Um, so I had always thought, up to that point, as an actor, I'd always considered voice acting kind of emotionally safe um, because there was a very clear wall between myself and the material I was working on. But as we were working on Steins Gate, which gets really real, um, especially like in certain moments where like the character was so much like me to begin with that I was like already struggling as an actor being like man I don't want to turn this into a performance that's like me commenting on how I prefer to right. be seen. I want to be you know as real as possible so and I'm also writing it and I'm also working very closely with everyone else you know and it was just there was a lot of pressure and I had a breakdown in the booth one afternoon for a really pivotal scene where the character is having a breakdown so it kind of worked and I did. In fact, I had a breakdown, and I just, I just kind of, I literally wound up on the floor in, a, in the fetal position, crying. I know it sounds terribly dramatic, but I was exhausted, and it was a really rough scene, and I just lost it. And I never had something like that happen to me before in the booth. Like I said, I'd always thought of it as being safe, and, and sure, I could cry and feel stuff in the booth. I always do, but I never crossed that line where I'm like, I don't know who I am anymore, and I, I'm kind of losing my mind, and I just lost it. And Colleen, God love her. She was like, my phone? <laughs> you okay in there? And I'm like, and I was, it was that ugly cry, the kind when you're like four years old, and it's like, me, yeah, <laughs> me. And she was like, Let, let's take a break. <laughs> so I went and I splashed water on my face, and I'm like moping around the whole of animation. And I come in ready, I gotta do this, I gotta do this scene again. And I walked into the studio, she's like, how are you feeling? Well, we have a decision to make. Uh, we can do it again, that whole scene. Or, we can use everything you gave us because we just placed it and it works. And I was like, place it and let's use that. I don't want to do it again. So now you can actually hear me having a, a real life. <laughs> There's a fun fact. Uh, 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 breakdown in that episode. It's episode 13 of Science Gate. And it's like the best, it's the best promo I've ever had. Um, but that, that changed me as, a, as an actor and as a person because I realized... I, I don't mean to suggest that I, that was the first time I ever took my job as a voice actor seriously, because I always try to take it seriously. It's a job, it's an honor to do. Yeah. But that was the first time I had really connected so deeply on a character in that kind of environment that I was like, oh, it's not safe anymore. <laughs> and, and I love that, I don't want it to be safe anymore. That's not why I became an actor. So whenever I've got the chance to, to be confronted with that kind of risk, I've learned to embrace it, and it's because of that. So that was very long. Awesome. That was a very long walk to take. No, that's yeah. we wanted it. We Thank love you. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have won. I've been so lucky, you guys. I've gotten to do so many great shows and great characters. Um, but the show that I connected with and I loved, and it it changed the way I work. Actually, I'm a very technical actor. Um, but it's a little show called Princess Tutu. And I fell so in love with that show, and it was one of the first times that I worked, everybody who worked on that show really loved it, and um, that was the first time I ever experimented with recording a lot of pages at a time, like in one take. And um, I was just so invested in it, and I cried at the end. There's video evidence on YouTube of me bawling my eyes out, watching the end of the show, and freaking out. Um, but it, I, it taught me about fandom. It taught me about that, that you love what you love. Like, you can't pick the show that you're going to love. <laughs> it picks you. And um, I don't know, it did. It just sort of changed me. I, was, I loved it, and I... I loved it. Just loved it. Thank you. We love you. It was beautiful. Ah, I love, love you. Everyone loves you. Would anybody else like to answer? You don't have to. I'm only asking. No? Um, I, I do, but I always like to go last, though, because it's a downer. But it, I'm here, and I'm fine. It's just, um, Justin, do you want to? Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, goodness. I like it. I like that. I'm just saying. I, I, 
It's hard to nail one in particular down, but something I've noticed lately, uh, I play a character named Prince Dida in the <gasps> Ranking of Kings. Uh, oh. I'm his mother! My liege. <laughs> yes! I'm his mother! I love that show. Okay. Uh, and, and what Dida means to me and several other characters of his ilk is, uh, for a while there, I, I got cast as really nice, sweet, kind boys. Um, and that's great, that's great. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, but characters such as Dida have, have let me, you know, tap into parts of myself that aren't so nice. They're natural, but they're not very nice. Um, and, and it's a productive outlet for stuff like that, as opposed to, I don't know, <laughs> people that you like. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always nice to do a little bit of detective work with these characters and find one weird thing we've got in common and sort of navigate from there. So, uh, you know, nothing revelatory that I can tell you. Um, but it's changing your pace a little bit from the is. norm. I, I get to know myself better um, when getting to play these characters that aren't, that aren't, and, and I, I'm okay saying that they're not, but I get to, uh, little kernels of, I don't know. Different shades of the character. Yeah, role. the person that I, I truly am, that I'm still getting to know. Uh, it helps me get a little closer. Well said. Very well said. Oh, shucks. <laughs> My lady. So beautiful. Um, so in Ruth the Band-Aid, in uh, spring of 2014, I lost my dad. Um, and everybody does awe. And it's, yeah, it is objectively sad. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a weird time. And when I got back from the traditional like week and a half of Southern grieving, that is a lot of food, um, I really wasn't sure what to do because grief doesn't stop when the the trappings of it go away and uh, two days after I got back there were auditions for a show called Danganronpa the animation and I wasn't gonna go I wasn't gonna do it and uh, my husband was just like hey maybe like live maybe maybe do it and I did and I ended up booking a character named Asahina who is the brightest, happiest, most joyful, positive girl in the whole world, and I loved her. And I got to show up every couple of days for like six weeks and just be her and live in this happy space. And then, in the show, she experiences a huge loss, one that nearly exactly mirrored what I was going through. And I was terrified. I watched ahead. I shouldn't have done it. And I did. And I saw it coming at me like a Mack truck. And I am so thankful. I had a, a friend who at the time was the production assistant who would like let us all in the building. Um, and I let her know. I was like, hey, today's going to be weird. And I did not let uh, Christopher Bevins, our director, know. But like, he could. Um, <laughs> and she has this whole episode. She has this whole scene where she is angry. She is angry at everyone, and she lays the blame at their feet, and she tells them, and I got to say things and feel things that I didn't know I needed. And I got to be healed by this work that, like, acting, creating stories, it has always been where I run to. But I had never been such an active participant in my own healing through art before. And at the same time, I also felt very much still an outsider. I had not been in this industry for very long. And I had comfort waiting for me immediately after the catharsis. I had uh, Bevins, I had Catherine. I had a building full of people just happy to see me and like ready to be there. And it was just this moment of like healing and community. And I'm never going to forget it my whole life. That's incredible. That's so good. You all answered that so well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Let's, let's turn the boat a little bit. Um, are reaction shots challenging to you? Reaction shots meaning <laughs> grunts. Any type of where the, where the character physically like looks up and smiles and makes a coy little or you, you know what I mean. Have you guys heard this? I've heard directors tell me that they know new people because like based on reactions is that real yeah. i think so because i think actors especially if they've never done this kind of work before 
like having this mic in front of you when you know it's so intimate it's right here and i think your instinct is to hold back if if it looks like you need to be loud so i mean i when, when i directed i would have actors in the booth that you know maybe they've been doing this for a while but they'd never played a very active or a very a character that had a lot of screaming or reactions to do and so like i seriously had someone in the booth it was wonderful but the minute they had to scream as though they were falling off a building it was like ah <laughs> i was like no that's i mean I, i'm glad you made your peace with what falling off a building is like for you it's not what this character is doing and uh so they and you really had to like it's okay we're gaining it down you're not going to take out the mic it's we're prepared and like you really had to teach them or just you had to give them permission to go all out because they feel like oh, I don't want to do it. Especially when you're on stage, man. You're used to playing in the back row, but when it's right here and it's like, oh, I want to, I want to just like be really NPR about it and not <laughs> scream. And some people just don't aren't very good with you know. I shouldn't say very good. There's just a learning curve, I yeah. think, with reactions. I, I feel like man, when I first started, uh, it was it made so much sense because it's always that you know the the whatever, the school crush walks by, and it's a, it's a, here, actually, I would love real quick, you guys, so school, school crush walks by, you have an OM notice, uh, and it's, it's very small. That means open mouth notice. O OM notice, okay, school crush walks by. Okay, I'll, actually, here, I'll act it out for you. So I'll be the crush. You be the school crush. Okay, we're gonna take, yeah, I'll be the crush. Okay, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll go, you know, I'll, I'll point at you when, when the react happens, okay? So I'll be like, so first Felicia, I'll be like, First-time actor. First-time actor. Do that. Okay. So this is what you're a master class. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Do, does the actor watch anime? You decide. Okay. You decide. No, 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 no. We say no. Okay. 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 Here, okay. God. Here we go. Ready? Okay. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Iteration. This is a master class. And <laughs> welcome to voice acting. What I, uh, I, out, in, out in Dallas, uh, I, I study classical theater over at SMU, and the Ecphenesis, uh, Shakespeare would call it, that's the O. Oh, oh, she does teach the torches to burn bright. It's just a sound, right? Just a big old O, oh, because Shakespeare gave you a big vowel to use. And so when I was trained with that, like, watching anime, I was like, oh, I get it. That's because words fail. I see someone, they're so beautiful. I see something, it hurts so much. Whatever it is, words can't attach to it, so I just make a sound. But it has to resonate, it has to touch something. So the first iteration, when you guys heard, it definitely, like, resonance happened in each, you heard, you, I know you've watched enough anime, all of you have. You heard, you heard the point of view of each person. But the first time, the second time, it's kind of like, this is a sound, right? Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> when I when I direct new people that that struggle with that, I always say you have to tie it to motion and emotion. There has to be a physicality behind it. There's to be a reason we're making the sound, and it has to express something because otherwise you get. <laughs> Yeah. For everything, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. It, it has to come from the body. Acting it's always comes sometimes. from the body. And, and sometimes people that, that uh, start with voice acting as their first experience as an actor, they don't know that. They don't, they, they, I think they're not very comfortable in their body. I mean, who is comfortable in their body? I'm not. And so they, I think they're drawn to acting. Sometimes they're drawn to voice acting because they feel like, oh, it's like acting, but I don't have to worry about what to do with my hands. <laughs> so, which is totally, that's nothing. There's in the booth like that. But you have to learn how to be, yeah. You have to learn how to be in your body because, you know, like a director like a Felicia can tell you immediately whether that sound came from your throat or your gut or the, your toes. Like, and that's, you know, depending on what's necessary. And you have to be able to tap into all of that and not just do kind of a monkey see, monkey do sound, which a lot of first-time actors do they'll just try to imitate what they're seeing on screen which is perfectly fine but you, to make it personal you've really got to go into your own body and be like how would that sound come out of me if I 
was suddenly, you know, just gut punched by desire yeah. for someone as they walked by. You're getting free lessons. I did have a hard time. And then I still hate closed mouth reactions just because I am chronically sniffly. Like, oh, yeah. Plug like, nose sucks. Oh, it's like, just not yeah, sound. It's an allergy <laughs> season comes around and you got to do. And closed mouth running, I think, is elitist. Nobody does it. We're all, none of us <laughs> in that good of shape. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> Every sports anime I've been in, all the guys, except for like, yeah, all like in Princess Stride, or like, uh, he's the Takaru, who's like the, the super fit one, and he's an anchor. He's just like, soundlessly, <laughs> only exhale, because he's incredible. Exhale. Yeah, <laughs> everyone else is like, <laughs> how many more laps? Yeah. I did have to build a Rolodex uh, in the beginning for things that you don't do, like um, closed mouth standing or closed mouth sitting. Uh -huh. And like, if I were to do it now, because I make noise when I sit and stand, but it's because I have old knees. Ah. Right? <laughs> and that's not what Sounds I'm like Blake. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like getting older. As I get older, I realize I'm making sounds, and I'm like, why the hell am I doing that? I don't make noises. Sometimes, sometimes when you're in your oh, 40s, boys and girls, you just say ow because you feel obligated to. <laughs> not because you feel it. Ow. Sorry, nothing hurt. I'm fine. I just. Why'd you say ow? I don't know. <laughs> why? I think, I think what Justin said too is like particular to like fight, fighting. We do a lot of fighting yeah. and stuff, but a lot of that is getting out of your own way. Like if you judge, it, it's going to sound dumb. You're going to sound dumb all the time. Um, and as soon as you sort of make your peace with that and stop worrying about it, you'll do a better job of just being able to react to the screen and what's happening in a way that is authentic. Um, and yeah, a lot of that is just getting out of your own way and not being afraid of the microphone. Yeah. You know, mic technique goes a long way. Okay, that's a quick question because you guys, we've done, we've all like, we've all died, right? Character wise, like we've all died. So yes. Right? Like, so. Man, so many you guys, like, that's something, right? Dying. Like, obviously, like, yeah, it's like, you know, talk about that. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, you, it's like a therapy session. And I, you hey, have to guys die, <laughs> die while hitting the flaps. Yes, so they're like, <laughs> like getting like, you know, monster comes out of the wall and starts just eviscerating. Okay, here we go, go. And you just see like, <laughs> and I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, big open, uh, 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 blood comes out, piece of bone, blah, got it. And so, do I start dying on an inhale or an exhale? Yeah, can, it, we, tell can we tell? Can we tell? These right, are the questions. These are, These are the questions. Anyway. So, so, what were you talking about? Oh, I, I'm sorry. No, it's just that. I just think about like how fantastic that is. Because, you know, these big creatures are doing all these crazy things to us. Like, we get vaporized by some big old, you know, beam from some alien, yeah. whatever. And we're like, what does that feel like? Yeah. Is that like fire? Because I know what fire feels like. <laughs> but, like, all over me. Is that, uh, yeah, so that's when you get to hear a lot of, I think Mike McFarlane, uh, his favorite for me is the, is the blood splatter when you see like someone get cut and then the gout of blood goes, so Blair. like mine, <laughs> like the <laughs> kind of like thing. Yeah. That's my Did favorite. Anybody see, has anybody seen the, um, um, the Full Metal Alchemist movie? Yeah. The movie? Nobody has. No, no one's, no one's. Because I, I, I play Wrath. And Wrath is, his demise is really unique. Yeah. And I just want you to imagine, like, yes, yeah, saying your lines while you are being chomped. <laughs> so you've got blood and you've Marched got and weird things and, you know, it's an interesting, again, I'm a, like I'm a very technical actor. And so that to me is a really fun challenge. I love that stuff. I, I love it. I have, I'm, <sighs> I am stubbornly proud of having once made an engineer puke. Yes. Who was it? This, it, was, it was a show called uh, 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 Shiri, uh, Shiguri, Death Frenzy, and it's, it's a not, if you're not over 18, don't even think about watching it. But it's a very violent show and a very kind of realistic portrayal of the life of a samurai during the Edo period. And um, I played a character at one point, he just spins the entire credit sequence in the background, vomiting his guts out because of what he's just seen happen. And it goes on for like a good 30 seconds. And like, and Which was, is just longer than you think. It's you especially when you're puking. Yeah. Make you throw um, up sounds for 30 seconds. Yeah, and I am 
I discovered that day really good at making vomit noises. Very convincing. I mean, there's you can tell what I'm vomiting on. Such and specificity, I love it. I didn't know I had that skill, but it was Bevins, and Bevins always loves to do the technical yes, stuff. He's yes. like, I want, I want to hear the wet, make the space. I want to hear, hear the heave, I want to hear you coughing and trying not to choke on it. You know, and I'm like, okay, and I, and, <laughs> okay. I'm like, what's well, up? I mean, I'm getting paid, so I. <laughs> Look, Mom, I'm an actor. Yeah, um, cool. <laughs> and I had to do like this 30 second take of just constant heaving grossness. And I was really proud of it. And the engineer guy, I was there, was Nick. Yes. Uh, yeah, he hasn't been there in a number of years, but it was Nick. And Nick was like a horror movie fan. This was not a guy with like a weak constitution. And there was just something about hearing someone vomit that just made him go, oh, I gotta do it now yeah, too. It's like it's so, like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, Bruh! and that's not what it sounded like. It sounded far worse but I don't want to start a puke fest in here, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but I did this for 30 seconds, and I was like really proud. And I'm just guzzling water afterwards because it dries you out like no one's business. And then I just see Nick just go, Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> <laughs> and he leaves. And then Bevan's and I are like, what, what did we call it? We haven't guessed it. No, he'll be back in a second. Then he comes back, and he's like, <sighs> and I'm like, what happened? He's like, I, I just puked. <laughs> I'm like, I made an engineer puke! <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Achievement unlocked! Yeah. It's a rare one. Do you guys ever get tired of hearing yourselves? Is there a point in time, seriously, where you're tired of hearing your own voice over and over, day in and day out? Like in my head or like in my career? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can say both, but let's just say career. In the booth, or, or seeing your shows so much all over the place. Um, is there ever just a, a fatigue of sorts? Or are you just used to it, this is what it is, and I love it, which is also awesome. I, I work on a lot of uh, different, I, I'm, as, as my colleagues do, we work on a bunch of different things, sometimes like audiobooks, or, and I, I, I work with a, a company, that's Microsoft, or, uh, but, but like, uh, there's, we do these long stretches of text that I edit myself, and man, that technical stuff, I do like cybersecurity stuff for them, and so it's like, all right, so this is like Azure Cloud, blah, blah, blah. So like, I wonder, oh yeah, and someone reached out to me. They're like, oh my God, are you my hero? <laughs> like, I took a class from me. Miria was teaching me how to, how to freaking kill some hackers, you know, destroy some hackers. And anyway, um, but that said, uh, a little bit, a little bit, like especially if I'm editing my own stuff. I guess like, it depends on the project. I just get like annoyed at when I mess up. I'm like, damn you, Don't we all? past Rico. Yeah, Do it again, but better. Like, in auditioning and stuff, just like letting go and letting God, because you have to listen to yourself back to do the edits, and you just hear and you're like, oh, I could have done that, but it's like 10:45, and I am so tired. Yeah. And I guess you learn from it, right? Yeah, that's a plus. You forgive yourself. It's yeah. important, important thing. Forgiveness, it's a good thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do you get tired of yourself, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Never. Weren't you tired? <laughs> I will say, loosely related. Uh, you know how, like, when you first hear your voice recorded, and you're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's been me this whole time? <laughs> this whole time? You've been, in, you've been enduring no that? Told me? No one told you. Oh, God. Uh, now, you know, you do it long enough, you get used to it. And now, you know, how I speak, I hear it in my head, and that's how it actually sounds. Uh, so there is hope. You don't sound weird. I sound weird. <laughs> is there any advice you can give to somebody Dealing and experience with self-doubt. So much. <laughs> you are in good company. Uh, I think I I would say that um, I think it is very easy to think that people who have a career or who are doing anything that that you look at and you go, wow, they look really confident, <laughs> you know. Or um, most of us are not. You know, um, everybody has sort of struggled with self-doubt. One thing I can say of myself, because we've already established that some of us are a little bit older, um, <laughs> is that I did not have my self-doubt on display. I think the internet um, can create a lot of opportunity for either seeing people put a false projection of confidence out or just showing you parts of themselves. It's a place where you can take your own you know, um, worries about yourself or whatever and broadcast it if you feel like it. I didn't grow up with that. So all of my self-doubt um, 
I just had to feel it sort of work through. <laughs> um, and, and these careers, like my career, I've been doing it for a really long time. It wasn't like this in the beginning. You know, I worked multiple jobs, multiple day jobs. Um, and it took a long time for me to sort of build up to be able to do this. All that to say, you can do this. You can do what you want to do. It may take a little while. That is okay. You may change your mind midstream. That is okay. Um, it's really okay. There are lots of ways to get to how wherever you want to go. What works for me may not work for you. That is fine, you know. I, I want to always be a person who is like, if you want to do something, I really truly think you can. It may not look like what you think it will be, but you can, you know? And I hope you surround yourself with people who are telling you that. God, that's so... You know? If I can jump in there real quick. Yes. Because uh, I love everything you just said. But guys, there is something wrong with human beings in general. We are hardwired. We could have 10 people that we know and love tell us they believe in us. And all it takes is one stranger to tell us we're nothing and that's who we believe. And it's sad and I hate it. I'm just as guilty of it as anyone else. It is something about how we're made and it's the biggest challenge you will ever learn in your life is how to just live in someone else's good opinion of you. Because it's none of your goddamn business why someone loves you. Let them love you. Like, you may not like that you're loved for this or that. Doesn't matter. Be loved by it and bask in it and be like, that's also me. That is also me. Maybe that I'm also dealing with this stuff over here that I don't want people to see because when I'm weak or I'm mean or I'm this or I'm that, and that's okay. You're allowed to be complicated, but you're also that. You're also the thing that somebody loves and looks up to and needs, whether you like it or not. And so, when I was a kid, I'm going to tell a quick story. <laughs> Says the guy that can't tell a quick story. Um, when I was a kid and I was really beginning, I've been acting since I was very little, and I was beginning to look at doing it as a career, like an honest career going into it. I, mean, no, I wanted to do it on camera so badly. And I had the chance, I won't tell you what it was, but I, I got this amazing audition and it was terrifying. I had to fly out of town to do it. First time I would have ever been on a plane. I was just in my head, but it was amazing. I'll tell you right now that this would have been in the 80s. Had I gotten that part, had I gotten that role, it would have changed my life forever. And I didn't do it. I studied, I had weeks to prepare, and I was I was surrounded by all these people that were like, oh my God, you would be perfect. Oh, I can't wait. My parents were supportive. I was very fortunate to have a family that got it. And as weird as I was, I'm a weird kid, they, they supported me in all the weird things I wanted to do. And my friends were like, that's so cool. Like, I was very lucky to have that. And I wasted it because one person that I didn't know very well just was like, you shouldn't try it for that. That's not you. You're not that good. And I listened to him because I didn't really want to do it. Or I did, but I was afraid. I was afraid and I have learned, this is not always the case, but I've learned that when we listen to those negative voices, whether they're coming from inside us or they're coming from out here from somebody that just wants to pull you down, sometimes we listen to them and follow their advice because we don't want to face something else that's bigger. We'd rather give up and live in someone's negative opinion of us than actually risk going and doing the thing we don't feel we're ready for. Well, I am here to tell you there is no such thing as being ready. Nope. You just do yeah. it. And it's the thing, I, the best line I've ever been, I've ever, because I deal with anxiety and fear and self-doubt all the time. I know we don't project it very much because we're actors. I've just learned how to transmute it so that it looks different when it's out there. And that's part of the challenge, I guess. But it's still, I live in it all the time. But, and I judge myself for being a coward. I judge myself for feeling anxious. I judge myself for not taking more chances than I did because my comfort zone is smaller than I am. Uh, but I, God, man, watching Doctor Who when I was a kid, <laughs> there's a time when, like, the, the, the second doctor, um, excuse me, the third doctor, Pertwee, I know, it's old school, uh, is having this vulnerable conversation with a soldier who's really beating himself up for having been afraid during a really key battle. And the doctor says this beautiful thing that has stayed with me all these years, and I want you to remember it. He's like, courage has nothing to do with not being afraid. Courageous people, like fearless people, never have the chance to be courageous to be courageous. 
leaves courage is being afraid and doing it anyway. And that's what I've learned. And you do that by relying, by listening to the people that believe in you, even if you don't believe them. You gotta give them credit. They love you for a reason. They love you for a reason. Let them have it. I got, oh man. Oh, you guys, this is such a good, this is a good panel. I know. <laughs> Uh, to doubt, what in the face of doubt, what in the face of doubt. This is the, 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 and I stake my life on this, you guys. Honestly, like there's, there's nothing I believe more uh, than, than what, what I'm about to tell you. And that uh, the only person you need to prove anything to is yourself. The only, only person in any of your endeavors, any of your endeavors, you need to prove anything to is yourself. Citing Tatum's story, having someone, uh, I did not have a lot of support coming in, coming into the performance and stuff, but if you can prove to yourself, what I like to do, you guys, is for the doubt. I'm like, if I'm ever feeling low, didn't get a thing, had some you know, crazy auditions and I blew it, and again, like not a lot of money, my you know, family's like, oh my God, you're gonna be an actor? What is that? You're hurting everyone with your choices. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, but I want to do it, Father. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and so, uh, and then, you know, even when I meet success, right? My, I remember my grandfather saw me on a commercial that I made, like, you know, my year in a day. And he's like, oh, did they pay you for that? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, you know, sees me on TV, my grandfather, right? It's my family. It's, you know, make your family proud and all that. People come over to the house. He's like, uh, oh, this is my grandson. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's a, he's a teacher. And I always, I'm like, I'm an actor. I'm an actor. But people, no matter who in your life you're trying to prove something to, or trying to like see, have them see your value. Guys, legitimately, at the end of the day, if you have that value in yourself, that will shine brighter onto the people, your community, around you, everything, and it will be, it will, it will shine right back. Like that, that was like the turnkey moment for me. And so what I do, when I'm not feeling too hot, I do one push-up. <laughs> do one push-up. Can't do one, do a knee push-up. Can't do one knee push-up, do a wall push-up. But find where you are and meet it head on. And prove it to yourself that you can do it. And then, if you're getting spicy, do two. <laughs> and then she'll be doing 200 burpees and you'll be like, wow, I'm really strong. Uh, and you prove it to yourself. You prove it to yourself that you can do it. And guess what? All the naysayers and all the people that have been saying anything, you can't even hear them anymore because you're too badass. Oh, 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 oh. Um, for me, I, I have two things, and I promise I'll make them quick, but uh, one is, is sort of a yes and, um, is uh, you are accountable for you, and also the external doubt that you may be receiving from the people in your life may not be what you think it is. One of the greatest lessons of my life was learning about the double-edged sword of love and fear. The people who love you are afraid for you. They love you so much they want you to be happy and safe. And for a lot of us, uh, I grew up in the rural south, and that looked one way. It looked a very specific way, and I was not hitting any of those milestones. <laughs> and so there was this resistance, and I thought, oh, you don't think I can do this? And it was never that, it turns out. I think a lot of them thought I could do anything, and it scared them because I listened. They told me I could do anything, and I was like, all right. And they're like, no, no, no. Um, and they just want to make sure when you jump off the cliff, there's something to catch you, and they can't. So they tell you, don't jump. Um, or have something to fall back on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know. You know whether the leap of faith is worth it. And the other thing, I just want us all right now to know, whoever you are, wherever you are in your life, right now, right this second, you are worthy of your own love. Mm. You are worthy of your own kindness, the kind that you give to other people. You deserve that right here, not some future version of you that you've decided is better and more perfect and more worthy, you, right now. And you take that and you own it and you go through your life with it, because it's true. Yes. Me for the end of these. Uh, <laughs> you're the anchor, bro. You bring it home. Bring it home, Justin. Right. Just to just to keep it brief. Um, those closest to you don't want to see you fail. 
they don't. Your peers, your mentors, your instructors, your friends, they don't want to see you fail. They're not coming to your piano recital to be like, oh, I hope they hit a wrong note so bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if they do, it's pathetic. Uh, yeah, so as everyone has already said it really, really sweetly and nicely, uh, the people that are important to you and the people that you find will be important to you, they always want to hear, they want to see you do your best. And you, you can't always be your best, um, but they want to see you do as good as you can. Um, and if you find someone in your life doesn't, they, they want you to be less than, they want you to be car compartmentalized, uh, or they're rooting against you, then you, you gotta, you know, you owe it to yourself to uh, not stick around. Mm. Yep. That's true. Woo! Thank you, guys. Thank you. I mean, that bit all, I gotta tell you, you guys, really, that was the icing on the cake, because we're at, we're at our show's end. Wow. Right. So, Whoa. thank you. Seriously, thank you for sharing thank you what you guys. Yes. We appreciate it. Guys, can we clap for these amazing people? Because we all learned a lot more than we thought we would. Yeah. So, thank you. The, the good news thank is you. they're coming back. The good news thank is we'll you have you again. If we, if we didn't mention it, thank you for watching My Hero Academia. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the show. The show that we're in. Thank you, guys. Because Jokester is here. Two are single person here. Um, but I've, again, been doing about this show. This show also changed my life. I've, I've never been a part of a show that has become such a collective thing for so many people to enjoy sort of across the spectrum. And uh, it's a special one to all of us, I think. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Without you guys, we're just crazy people in padded rooms making funny noises. That's so right. thank you. <laughs> You guys are the best thing about what we get to do. So, thank you. Thank you for letting us do it and supporting us. We really, really appreciate it. You are helping us work through so many mental issues. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. We'll be back. If Rob looks at audience. <laughs> I mean, you guys can stay. We, we all love you. I mean, you can stay for as long as you want, but I think you've got things to do. Roll, I, suppose, I, I suppose. think we're so. going to have dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to go have dinner. I think you're going to feed us or we're going to feed her there. Yes. Where, where are you going? <laughs> What's the good? Nowhere. We've decided it's Rico's job to figure it out. Felicia and I decided that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, don't, I don't know where you go. <laughs> Everybody, Jimmy John's up me. That's I'm, I'm lying. I'm lying. It's not happening. It's yeah, not 170 reso. <laughs> You guys like Hell's Kitchen? Hell's Kitchen? Oh, they got, I tried to get a reservation there. They, they, they all booked up. Yeah, there's one in Burbank. It's right across from our gym. Guys, for real though, thank you again. This Last is a delightful panel. Thank you, thank you. Yeah.